Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you're calling in from. I hope all of you enjoyed this very fascinating, relaxing soundscape that was played for us this morning. Uh, Mark will be talking to us a little bit about these sounds throughout his presentation, so I won't give anything away right now, but uh, definitely will clear up the mystery. So uh, we've got a lot to cover today. We've got an awesome presenter. We've got an awesome topic. We've got about an hour to dig into all of this. Uh, but, but before we go any further, we just want to take a little bit of time to acknowledge the original caretakers of the land that we're on. And we know that a lot of you are calling in from different places across Canada, across the globe. So I just want to take uh, a moment to invite you to think about a place that's special to you, a place that you can root yourself in, and uh, feel some gratitude and uh, acknowledge the original caretakers of that place. So for myself, I am in Calgary, so I acknowledge the traditional territories of the peoples of the Treaty 7 region of Southern Alberta, which includes the Blackfoot First Nation tribes of Siksika, the Pagani, the Gaina, the Stony Nakoda First Nation tribes of Chiniki, Beerspa, and Wesley, and the Sutina First Nation. The city of Calgary is also homeland to the historic Northwest Métis and to Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3. Uh, and just to kind of anchor ourselves in this experience of land acknowledgement as well, after I introduce Mark, he's going to take a little bit of time to reflect on uh, why land acknowledgement is really important and how it can help connect us uh, in the arts and in energy transition. So we're going to move to the next slide and the next one. And just to give a little bit of context uh, about the Energy Futures Lab, I know many of you have never joined uh, an EFL event before. So I just want to talk a little bit about who we are, how this series came to be, uh, and what it's going to look like moving forward. And then I will introduce the one and only Mark Hopkins and hand over the virtual mic to him shortly. So uh, the Energy Futures Lab is an Alberta-based coalition of innovators and leading organizations and together we're working in this space to create solutions with what we call uh, an energy system that is fit for the future. So this requires a lot of consideration. Uh, we know that Energy transition is about more than just technology or about the resources around us. It's a really personal subject. Energy is something that impacts each and every one of us every day when we turn on the lights or we get in our car or anything we do really. So it's important for us to be able to draw on diverse perspectives. And this is what makes us a social innovation lab. So we have 70 fellows from all kinds of backgrounds, artists like Mark, we have uh, other individuals who run companies, who work in utilities, who work in finance, you name it, uh, they're working with us. And all of these people coming together is really what's created a spirit of co-creation, being able to collaborate on similar complex issues, uh, but being able to look through different lenses and, and tackle the subject matter at hand. So as the name implies as well, this is the uh, big ideas for our Energy Future series. So it is a series that we've been running since the spring. And it came to be uh, after an article was written last spring. So the article was called Five Big Ideas for Our Energy Future or for Alberta's Economic Recovery. And this was an article written by the lab's managing director, Alison Cretney, and the lab's founding director, Chad Park. And together they explored these five ideas. So we had uh, bitumen beyond combustion, we had geothermal, artificial intelligence, uh, machine and machine learning, as well as lithium and hydrogen. So these five ideas uh, were very appealing and interesting to people. So we ended up hosting two events. Uh, but as I talked about, uh, diversity is something that's really important within the lab, being able to think through different lenses. And we wanted to take the time to really acknowledge that the list doesn't stop at five. There are so many big ideas, so many really cool projects um, and things happening in the world and within the lab. Uh, so we wanted to make the space to be able to talk about those, which is what's created the series. And we will now move on to the next slide as well. 
All right, so we do have uh, two more sessions coming up. I'll talk a little bit more about them at the end of this event, uh, but we've got Truth and Reconciliation and Energy Development with Steve Saddleback, and that'll be two Tuesdays from now. And then uh, in October, we'll be hosting Megan Lohman to talk about e-mobility. So you can sign up for those. Uh, you can visit our website and there's more information there. Okay, so to keep things uh, interesting, we will be using a tool called Slido. So we're just going to do a little bit of a tech check to make sure that everybody is feeling comfortable, is able to get settled in uh, before we launch into a talk with Mark. So if you want to visit uh, www.slido.com, you will be asked for a code. And the code is art and energy. You just type that in. And then you'll be asked a question and the question is what's an arts experience that has stayed with you long after the event itself so we'll move to the next slide and that'll bring it up and so as we wait for people to share their experiences mark i would love if you would take a moment to answer this question for us yeah you warned me it was gonna get turned on me uh there's so many um one that uh, really, oh, Rec City was amazing. Whoever said that, yeah, Rec City was incredible. Uh, a show that really resonated with me, I saw it in Toronto, um, I believe Nightwood Theatre put it on. It was a show called Nirbaya uh, by a group of uh, all women um, Indian artists and, and Indo-Canadian, like artists of Indian descent. And uh, Nirbaya was uh, the name given to the woman who, um, in India was uh, horrifically sexually assaulted on a bus. It made international headlines. Uh, and the show sort of tells that story, but also uh, tells the the actual individual stories of, of uh, sexual violence that each of the actors has experienced. And yeah, it was it was a very difficult show to watch and, and deeply haunting and deeply impactful. How about you, Emma? Uh, yeah, well, first of all, that very much speaks to that uh, productive discomfort that you've talked about before, where it's uncomfortable, but it's necessary to really evoke change. So thank you for sharing that. Uh, for myself, something that's really stuck with me throughout the years uh, was actually on exhibit at the Glenbow Museum, and it was the Black Gold Tapestry. And so it was... Uh, two city blocks and it took the artist Sandra Sawatsky nine years to create and so it was inspired by another tapestry um, that had been created centuries ago and she essentially decided to tell the history of oil through stitching out all of these stories. You've got the dinosaurs, all these early uh, technological innovations and she stitched all of it over the course of nine years. Uh, and so that's something that I've been thinking about a lot. Just everything has a story. It all comes from somewhere and something so simple can sometimes have that story forgotten. So we've got so many answers uh, coming in. So feel free to keep on adding them in as we move along. Very Some great good. shows in there. Lots yeah. of Britroffin Night was so good. Anyway. Fabulous. All right, so we'll move on to the next slide. So who is Mark? Who is the one and only Mark Hopkins from Calgary, Alberta? So uh, we've already been chatting a little bit, but I'll introduce Mark. He is the artistic director of Swallow a Bicycle Theater, which generates productive discomfort through art making. Uh, he's also an associate with Human Venture Leadership, which seeks to build our collective capacities to reduce ignorance, error, waste, suffering, and injustice. Uh, he volunteers with the Calgary Foundation and the Center for Newcomers, and he's founded We Should Know Each Other, which is a community bridging initiative. Um, and so I've got Mark's bio, but I also just want to say that Mark is so much more than that. As a fellow of the lab, Mark is somebody who brings a ton of energy and a ton of passion to these conversations and really helps uh, put a unique spin on different conversations. So welcome, Mark. I'm going to hand over the virtual mic to you and looking forward to your talk. Thanks, Emma. I look at this uh, clean shaven, wide eyed, naive young man, and he has no idea that there's a pandemic ahead of him. Uh, 
so yeah, before I get started, I, um, A, thank you, EFL, for this platform. Uh, I'm looking at the participant list building, and you are a wonderfully accomplished and deeply intimidating group to be having this conversation with. So, whew, we're in for a ride. Um, why don't you, uh, uh, in addition to the bio that you so kindly shared, um, want to uplift the land acknowledgement that you offered. Uh, so. Uh, I'm a settler in uh, in Mokinstis, uh, which is now known as Calgary. Uh, Mokinstis being the Nittipi or Blackfoot name for this place. And um, my ancestors uh, came from Scotland, from Ireland, uh, from England. And, um, it, it, you know, recognizing the, the violent history of colonialism is vitally important for uh, everyone on Turtle Island, everyone that occupies this land. And um, wanted to, you know, in the theme of our talk, uh, briefly look at a couple of art interventions that, um, that speak to truth and reconciliation. I think engaging with Indigenous artists is one of the most important things that, that non-Indigenous people can do to learn the stories and to, to hear the perspectives. So Kelly, if you wouldn't mind moving to the next slide. So this is a work uh, by Kent Monkman. Uh, he was displayed at the Grenville Museum in Calgary a few years ago, um, currently based in Toronto in the District of One Spoon Territory, but uh, he's an interdisciplinary Cree artist from the Fisher River Cree Nation in Treaty 5 uh, Territory in Manitoba. I just invite everyone to, to look at this piece, uh, welcoming the newcomers for a moment. All right, thanks. And uh, before I move to the next slide, I will warn you, uh, it's a depiction of violence. Uh, so uh, if you want to take a moment, if that is troublesome to you, you want to take a moment to go to the washroom, this would be the moment. But yeah, if we can move to the next slide. So this is uh, a work called Disposable Red Woman by Destin Running Rabbit and Aman Bukhari. Uh, this appeared uh, sort of as a guerrilla uh, unexpected performance or installation in uh, in downtown Calgary in August 2017. Uh, this is, uh, you know, Stephen Avenue, for those who don't live in Calgary, a uh, major pedestrian uh, and shopping destination in downtown Calgary. And uh, unsuspecting passersby came across this bloody uh, dead body, uh, dead woman's body. Uh, and it was meant to draw attention to the the travesty of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls and uh, two-spirited Indigenous peoples. Um, and both of these uh, these artworks are, are uh, speaking to the truth part of truth and reconciliation, which I think uh, certainly white folks like myself can often skip over that part and try to go straight to the reconciliation. But um, we have to really understand what has happened here, what is happening here, and uh, art, as we'll get into over the course of the next hour, is uh, an incredibly powerful way to to do that. Um, and I want to also highlight: there's so I've been so lucky to work with Indigenous artists uh, here in Mokinstis, like Article Eleven, Making Treaty Seven, Adrian Stimson, Troy Emery Twig, Sable Sweetgrass. There are so many indigenous artists and I heartily encourage you to seek out the indigenous artists that are working near where you are. And I also, uh, before we move on to the presentation itself, wanna acknowledge that in the midst of uh, COVID-19, um, the cracks in our society are really showing and we've, uh, in addition to the ways that this pandemic has uh, disproportionately impacted indigenous populations. It's been the same for, for many racialized populations and the state violence we've been seeing uh, has been horrifying and uh, speaks to changes that need to be made everywhere, energy sector, art sector in the world. And we're seeing uh, ripples of that in the art sector. If you can move to the next slide, um, even just this week uh, in Calgary, uh, the Pink Flamingo Collective is uh, finally, after many hurdles, putting up a painting a Black Lives Matter mural 
uh, in downtown Calgary and they've been receiving, this artist and that collective have been receiving uh, threats of violence, racialized attacks. And if you go to the next slide, the same thing happened uh, just this past week on Brendan's Got Talent of all places. Uh, there was a dance group called Diversity that did a Black Lives Matter inspired dance routine. And at the time of this article it had 15,500 complaints, but since then has had more than 21,000 complaints, uh, presumably of people who just want to be entertained and found that uh, this was too political for family audiences, which, um, and the, the artists have been heaped with racist abuse with threats of violence. And uh, this just speaks to the systemic challenges that we're facing in all sectors of society and the arts are certainly not immune from that. So something we can do is uphold black indigenous people of color artists. We can buy their work, we can share their work. And I wanna shout out, uh, there's so many I could shout out, but an old friend of mine, Simone Saunders, if you can move to the next slide. Um, she, among other things, was a co-founder in Calgary of the Ellipsis Tree Collective, which uh, is an Afrocentric theater company. And she has been killing it lately, uh, creating hand tufted textiles celebrating black excellence. And uh, you can see her work and buy her work at SimoneElizabeth.ca. So please do that. Uh, so with that, we're talking about art and energy transition. Um, so art, <laughs> what are we talking about when we talk about art? Uh, in general, of course, we're talking about, you know, the visual arts, the performing arts, um, literature, you know, uh, media arts like film, digital arts. Um, but in defining the arts, I'm really attracted to uh, the work of the philosopher Alva Noe and in this book, Strange Tools, Art and Human Nature, where he's grappling with this question of what is art and what is it for in um, human societies. And you'll see on the next slide part of why I'm attracted to his definition. On page 100, he says, art starts, oh, back one, art starts when things get strange. Just delicious, isn't it? Um, to understand what he means by that, uh, got to back up a little bit. So uh, in the book, Alvin Noe talks about how, um, how humans are organisms. We are organized uh, by, next slide please, by our genes. Uh, so we come pre-programmed, pre-wired with a set of behaviors, a set of characteristics uh, that organize us and the way we see the world, the way we interact with the world genetically. Uh, we're also organized by our cultures. We all are born into and uh, swim through various cultures throughout our lives. Um, cultures that we didn't design, that, that pre-exist uh, us that, that uh, have been developed over many generations. Um, and so as he says in the book, we are organized, but we are not the authors of our organization. Um, and he describes our lives as a big complex nesting of organized activities at different levels and at different scales. With me so far? So part of these organizing systems, uh, what humans do, we make tools. Uh, tools are these technological things, next slide please, that, uh, that help us organize our lives. So these are all examples of tools. Tools uh, can be these physical objects, they can be uh, organizing systems, language, um, any kind of technology that helps us to organize our lives. And having made these tools, they then become part of that big complex nest of organizing structures that then continue to help shape the way that we experience the world. So having made airplanes, airplanes have radically changed uh, our relationship to the globe, uh, to, to distance, <laughs> to uh, commerce. And uh, uh, so we continue to make new tools and those tools shape us even as we shape them. So where does art come in in all this? Uh, the way that Noe talks about it is that art is a tool, but it's a strange tool. And he bulks it in, he proposes that art and philosophy have the same function, that they are practices aimed at illuminating the ways we find ourselves organized, and consequently also the ways we might reorganize ourselves. Or I'll read this quote too. Uh, Artists make strange tools because tools, in the broad sense I've been urging, are critical for human beings. 
They organize our lives and, in part, make us what we are. Works of art put our making practices and our tendency to rely on what we make, and so also our practices of thinking and talking and making pictures, on display. Art unveils us to ourselves. Oh, sorry, art puts us on display, art unveils us to ourselves. So what he's proposing is that art offers a mirror. It helps us uh, look at the organizing structures that are often invisible, that we may not be conscious of, and, uh, and to consider it. So for a concrete example, a uh, pipe is a tool. Uh, it is a tool that has several functions, one of which is to uh, allow us to smoke tobacco. Uh, if you were to then paint a pipe, uh, it invites us to consider, wait, what is a pipe? What is a pipe for? Uh, and then with, of course, this very famous painting, the great La Trahison des Images, uh, where there is a painting of a pipe uh, with the text below saying, ceci n'est pas une pipe, this is not a pipe. It invites us not only to think about the pipeness of pipes, it also invites us to think about painting, about representation, about art. Uh, and this goes for, Alvin Noe proposes, uh, all of art. It allows us to look at things uh, that might otherwise be go unconsidered in the way that we organize the world. Cool. So that's how we're going to talk about art today. Uh, energy transition. So I would propose, uh, and I don't think it's too controversial to say that energy is perhaps the most powerful organizing force that acts on humans. Um, so I joined the Energy Futures Lab a couple of years ago, and uh, it's often been like a fire hose of information. Growing up in Calgary, you know, I, I'm surrounded by energy, the energy sector, oil and gas in particular, but discovered I didn't know much about it at all. So I turned recently to this book by Vaclav Smeal, who's an incredible energy historian and, and writer. Uh, and this book is uh, Energy and Civilization, a History, a sweeping look at uh, the ways that energy has interacted with human development and human societies from prehistory all the way to now. And he, uh, uh, right off the bat, very first page talks about energy being the only universal currency. One of its many forms must be transformed to get anything done. And goes on to offer that both prehistoric human evolution and the course of history can be seen as the quest for controlling greater stores and flows of more concentrated and more versatile forms of energy and converting them in more affordable ways at lower costs and with higher efficiencies into heat, light, and motion. So for thinking about art as a strange tool that allows us to examine the forces that organize us, uh, energy and energy transition are prominent in those forces. Uh, and that book uh, goes in interesting parallel with this one I recently discovered, Art and Energy, How Culture Changes by Barry Lord, which covers a similar uh, territory. Uh, Lord sort of goes through the, the prehistory and history of humanity to look at what are the prime movers, what are the prime drivers uh, in energy, and how they shape culture. It, he uh, offers the thesis of the book as energy transition is the engine of culture change. And uh, he, if, on YouTube, he gave a talk uh, you can find, well, he gave the talk at the Goethe Institute in Toronto, but it's on YouTube. Uh, and he said, all life depends on energy and all human life depends on energy. All human culture, which is essential to human life, it depends on energy. Each of our cultures is dependent on the energy sources that make them possible. That is to say, you can't have the culture without the energy source. It doesn't exist. It's not a question that the artist reflects something. It's that you don't have the artist, you don't have the culture, unless you have the energy source that makes it possible. So he points to uh, fire as one of the major energy sources in, uh, well, throughout our history, but certainly in our early prehistory, uh, that led to the culture of the hearth, uh, storytelling, playing music around the fire, making clay implements, etc. Uh, he points to the fact that any society that relied on slave labor uh, as a primary energy source required an accompanying culture that uh, accepts and justifies slavery, and so on. Um, and I guess one issue I would have with, with Barry Lord's argument is uh, that it 
does sort of seem to land a bit into like energy determinism, sort of unidirectional, uh, that culture is shaped by energy and not vice versa. But we're going to come back to that. So just put a pin in that thought. So, OK, we're talking about uh, art as a strange tool. We're talking about energy transition as uh, an incredible organizing force that, uh, as uh, Barry Lord points out, is inherently and deeply intertwined with culture. Cool. Now what? Uh, that's sort of where I got lost in preparing this presentation. Um, but fortunately, one of my colleagues at Swallow Bicycle Theater, uh, Bianca Guimaraes de Manuel, for a totally unrelated project, pointed me towards uh, this uh, podcast, uh, Invisibilia, uh, on NPR. Uh, this is the first episode of season six. And um, I wanted to share the whole thing, but it's like an hour and eight minutes long. Uh, really fascinating, really recommend it. Uh, and it gets into uh, four men who are grappling with climate change, are grappling with uh, this, and a problem of, of uh, scope and of tempo that we as humans respond to threats that are immediate, visceral, obvious, uh, and climate change is, well, arguably visceral, but over a very, very long period of time and very difficult to discern exactly what's happening. Um, so this uh, episode describes their journey to, to try to intervene and try to get people to care more about uh, what's happening. But uh, I want to zoom in on one of them, uh, Roger Payne. If you're of a certain generation, you may uh, recognize that name. Uh, I'm going to play or have Kelly play a couple of excerpts uh, from the podcast. And uh, just to set it up, uh, Roger Payne uh, had made the decision. He came across a beached whale that um, had been vandalized by people that had uh, cut off its tail, carved their initials into its side, stuck a cigarette butt into its blowhole. Um, and, you know, this really alarmed him. And uh, he sort of committed himself to finding ways to, to study whales and to find the things about whales that humans would care about. And uh, he found in this research, he ran across a, a man in the Navy named Frank Watlington, who <laughs> his job had been to eavesdrop on Soviets uh, using a powerful underwater microphone. But as he was uh, trying to record some explosions, he came across this interesting sound. Kelly, please. <laughs> started listening to this sound and my god it was the most extraordinary powerful sound i'd heard ever and i remember my mind was racing as i listened to this and i thought this this is the way if only you can get these sounds into the ears and the brains of the world that will steal the world's heart that's what i thought Roger fell more and more in love with this music. So in love, he says he essentially dropped out of his official job for about two years and devoted himself to assembling the most emotionally powerful collection of whale song he could possibly scrape together. And once I had enough recordings that I felt had enough emotional impact, and that's hard to do, by the way, then I thought, ah, I want to make a record. Unfortunately, Roger had no idea how to make a record. He did, however, have a friend who worked at a book publishing house. They'd never pressed a record before, but Roger convinced him and then started literally cold calling radio stations to see if they'd consider playing it on air. Just walk me through that, that, that phone call. It's like, hi, my name is Roger Payne, and I'm calling because I have a record of whale songs. Like, and, the, and, and at, to which they respond. You, you have to get there faster. You have to say, whale songs, is that anything that might interest you? Sometimes they hung up, sometimes he got lucky, but Roger wouldn't stop. 
He'd show up at concerts, talk his way backstage, and then ask stars like Mary Hopkin, a Welsh singer famous for the hit Those Were the Days, to listen in between sets. Her manager was, you know, mumbling things to her every few minutes. We're kind of like, oh, come on, yes, 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 you know. And she listened for the entire period between sets. And when she was done, she didn't remove her headphones. She wiped them slowly off her head while looking as if she was coming out of a trance and saying, that is the most beautiful sound I've ever heard in my life. I wish I could sound like a whale. Uh, then it gets into more successes. Uh, he manages to get on a bunch of talk shows. It ends up being a plot point in a Star Trek movie. And then... Now, decades of whale research hasn't been able to determine precisely what, if anything, whales are saying with their songs. But still, people were mesmerized. Why? Roger thinks it's because in the voice of the whale, they heard something they recognized. Themselves. Humpback whale song exists at a tempo and scale that humans can relate to. It sounds almost human. You can listen, as Mary Hopkin did, and say to yourself, that is what I do, only better. In fact, Roger believes that what people hear in whale song is a kind of distilled version of the most powerful part of human communication, emotion, which is why they're so taken with it. There are lots of people whose reaction to hearing whales sing is to weep. And here's the point. Once Roger helped make whales and their culture more visible to humans, people did respond. They started crying out more forcefully for the whale to be protected, and the Save the Whales movement gained momentum. The song of the humpback whale has become an anthem of sorts. Mr. Chairman, I'm here today to represent the children of the United States. Songs of the humpback whale was played for congressional committees, at UN conferences. A lot of my friends and I are worried that when we grow up and have children of our own, there won't be any more sea animals to see. Until ultimately, it helped public opinion shift enough that the International Whaling Commission felt pressure to rewrite its rules. In 1982, the IWC decided to implement a moratorium on commercial whale hunting. And though a few nations objected to the ban, once it passed, some important whale populations around the world did begin to bounce back. A big step toward saving the whale was taken today in London. And it's being called a victory for conservationists. So I found this just an incredibly moving uh, example of the way that art can, uh, can play into and impact the world. So if we think about this use of, of a strange tool, a album of whale music, uh, putting up a mirror to parts of the world that go unobserved, uh, to the lives and uh, complex and wonderful lives of whales, uh, the dynamics of whale hunting. Um, and uh, I love what they're talking about here of taking something that is uh, alien to humans outside of sort of the, the tempo and scale that we are used to and that we are primed to look at and finding a way to, to bring that to a human scale. Uh, which you can probably see where this relates to energy transition. Uh, going back to Vaclav Smil, um, toward the end of the book, he uh, looks at, you know, we're now in the fossil fuel era, uh, and can we go to the next slide there, Kelly? Um, and he proposes that uh, that epochal transition from the fossil fuel dominated global energy system to a new arrangement based solely on renewable energy flows presents an enormous and generally insufficiently appreciated challenge. The ubiquity and the magnitude of our dependence on fossil fuels and the need for further increases of global energy use mean that even the most vigorously pursued transition could be accomplished only in the course of several generations. 
So here, again, we have a problem of uh, tempo, uh, dealing with problems, energy transition and climate change, problems that are uh, spanning generations, not weeks or months or years. Um, and at scales that we are ill-equipped to understand. Uh, so it seems like following the path that we're on that what this calls for among many, many, many other interventions is a kind of whale song for energy transition. Um, so to look at what that might look like, uh, I'm actually gonna probably skip over a couple, basically these next three slides are a little caveat uh, that sometimes we can romanticize art, be like, we'll bring art into uh, whatever the social enterprise is, this, uh, this engagement and it will make things better. And sometimes it doesn't, sometimes it makes things worse uh, or just upholds the status quo. But uh, I did want to highlight a few artists that I've come across that are actively engaging their strange tools, their art practices to uh, look at energy transition and climate change. Uh, so I ran across uh, this uh, exhibition by Ackroyd and Harvey. Uh, called Stranded, just keeping on the whale theme. Uh, this was first shown uh, at the Natural History Museum in an exhibition called The Ship, The Art of Climate Change in 2006. And they were dealing on a couple of levels here. So this was a, a whale that uh, uh, washed up uh, on a shore in the UK. Uh, they cleaned the bones, they coated it in a, uh, what do they call it? A saturated alum solution. Uh, and then encrusted it with a chemical growth of ice-like crystals to get the effect that you see here. And they were dealing with at least a couple of things. They were trying to point to the fact that uh, in our immediately pre-petroleum energy era, uh, whale oil, of course, was uh, an incredibly important source of energy for the industrializing world, for uh, heat, for uh, lighting, for uh, product generation. Um, and uh, now whales are, and they were hunted nearly to extinction in that era. And now whales are facing a parallel problem along with all sea life of the acidification and heating of the oceans. Uh, so they're trying to grapple with these dynamics in this exhibition. Um, I also could not give a presentation on arts and energy transition without shouting out Alana Bartol who is uh, a Calgary-based artist, next slide please, uh, who has done this incredible project called the Orphan Well Adoption Agency. Uh, we talked about orphan wells and, um, and the opportunity of reclaiming uh, wells, but also the problem of orphan wells at a recent EFL event. And uh, what Alana uh, does in this piece is, uh, Basically, it sets up, it has mapped all the orphan wells in Alberta. It sets up an installation where you can go in and apply to adopt a well, like show your fitness to be a uh, adoptive parent to one of these, these poor orphan wells, um, which is just such a wonderfully clever way to draw attention to this really <laughs> huge problem in the energy sector in Alberta and environmentally. And she's currently working on, you should check out all of her links. Uh, she's working on a project called Dowsing and Digging, which uh, engages with coal mines in the Crow's Nest Pass. Um, and I also want to shout out a couple of my fellow fellows at the EFL. Uh, Evelyn Colleen is uh, a wonderful independent artist, as it says here, uh, visual artist uh, working in printmaking and other forms who her work uh, grapples with the Anthropocene, with human impacts on the ecosystem. Um, and then there's also uh, the wonderful Rio Mitchell, a documentary filmmaker, um, who her recent documentary, Fox Chaser, uh, follows a trapper in northern Alberta who uh, is maintaining a traditional lifestyle while grappling in the context of encroaching industry and a changing climate. So that's entirely worth checking out. And of course, there's countless other artists who are engaging uh, actively with energy transition with climate change that I can't shout out, and we need more. In fact, there's some on this call that we might have to talk to later. Um, and I'll just go to my closing slide here. Uh, this is... Uh, in my neighborhood. This is a piece, another piece of guerrilla art that I found really delightful. I snapped this photo just, I guess, last week. Uh, someone's been going around town. For those who don't live in Calgary, uh, our, I don't know, civic branding or, or motto or whatever is Calgary, be part of the energy. Uh, and someone's been going around 
pasting transition under it. And in fact, uh, this one, they've made a whole <laughs> bus bench piece of like guerrilla art vandalism, I guess, uh, which I just find deeply charming. Um, but it does uh, point towards the need for all of us to be part of energy transition, even if energy and the idea of energy transition feels distant from our lives, it's not. Um, what really stayed with me in reading the Klaus Meals Energy and Civilization is that uh, in the whole history of energy transitions uh, throughout all of human interaction with energy, none of them have been really planned. Uh, they've been either the result of uh, fuel running out, like deforestation in Europe or the near extinction of the whales, forcing an acceleration, an accelerated adoption of other prime movers, uh, or it's been be through gradual discovery and refinement of new and more powerful prime movers that, um, that replace, that, that are stronger, faster, more efficient than the existing uh, energy sources. But what is being asked of us now is to design an energy transition. We're at no immediate risk of running out of fossil fuels. We don't currently have uh, anything that is in the imminent future going to uh, exceed their capacity as an energy source. Uh, so we're being asked to do something we've never done before, which is design a global energy transition at a time when energy systems are more entrenched, more interconnected, more interdependent than they ever have been before. So this is something that humanity has never done before. Uh, it, is, it requires a full species effort. Um, and that includes artists. We need to use every tool at our disposal and even, and in some cases, especially the strange tools. That concludes my talking part. So I want to open it up to a conversation. Thank you, Mark. That was a fabulous presentation. Uh, I think you said it perfectly when you said that we need a whale song for energy transition. And such a perfect connect as well, thinking about whales and energy transition, uh, having hunted whales to near extinction for uh, lamp fuel for so many years. So thank you for that. Um, we're gonna turn back to Slido as well for a Q&A session. So if you go back to www.slido.com, then you'll see a Q&A section uh, where you can type in your questions. You can also upvote. So if somebody else asks a question that you think is uh, really interesting, you can upvote it uh, and we'll see which questions are the most popular and we'll make sure to answer those. So we'll just take the slides down uh, for now so we can see everybody's faces. If you wanna turn your video on, then that would be wonderful. If not, then that's all right too. Uh, and then while we wait for questions to come in, Mark, why don't we kick it off the two of us? I've got a couple questions for you. So, so the first question here, uh, we've talked a lot about the role that art can play in helping us make sense of big challenges. So energy transition being one of those. Uh, but sometimes it's a little bit more difficult to really uh, take hold of that. What's next? What, what, what do those next steps look like? So my question for you is how can the Energy Futures Lab really curate the right spaces or frameworks to help uh, accelerate the work of artists who are focused on energy and energy transition? Thanks, Emma. Uh, I mean, one thing is looking at this crowd, we have uh, artists present who are doing some incredible work. I'm looking at Kendra Fanconi, Evergreen Theatre, Savannah Harvey, uh, probably others that I'm missing in the list here that are, that are artists who have been working in uh, climate art and looking at energy systems for a long time. So I think, you know, that would be a low hanging fruit for the EFL to, to reach out to those people that have already been doing the work for, uh, for a long time. Uh, and I also want to give a shout out to the EFL for like, uh, in looking at energy transition, bringing in me and Rio and Evelyn, um, but also like at a recent gathering, we uh, 
I had the wonderful opportunity working with Evelyn and actually Jennifer Arsenault, who's on the call as well, and uh, Rio to uh, do a piece about cognitive biases that uh, invited a whole bunch of like uh, high powered energy executives to put boxes on their heads to uh, to look at how we are sometimes ignorant to other perspectives. Uh, and more recently, there was an engagement of science fiction writers to uh, to imagine possible energy futures that I think, Emma, we're going to do something with those stories that the public can engage with. Definitely. Uh, oh, we've got a couple of questions coming in. So we've got one from Laura Kennett. And the question is, what do you think is the role of government in supporting the arts as part of energy transition? Thanks, fellow, fellow Laura, who is also part of the Human Venture Leadership Group. Um, the role of government's huge. Like, uh, um, part of what I was thinking about doing this presentation was uh, what happened, I mean, the the action we need to take globally is beyond the scale of the New Deal in the States, beyond the scale of the mobilization for World War II, but those can be really helpful examples. And if you look at the New Deal in the States, uh, one of the many projects was the Federal Theater Project, which employed, I think, something like 15,000 artists across the country set up incredible touring networks where they could uh, have their work that they were creating in the moment, responding to the, the pressures of the Great Depression, uh that audiences could see themselves in often in collaboration with journalists uh and it could be seen by millions of people which is something that i can tell you as an indie theater is often not the case uh and so like while canada has like compared to some other places enviable public support of the arts uh i think we need massively more and it's not just arts funding it's also recognizing that for artists to make work we often exist in poverty. So uh, advocating for a universal basic income for like basically any supports that help people in poverty will help artists, will help artists make better art and art that engages more directly with challenging issues because that like, it's actually genuinely hard to do challenging status quo shaking work when you're reliant on uh, the ongoing cycle of grant applications or sponsors and struggling to put food on the table. So the government can do a lot. Thanks, Mark. So this next question, uh, I'll preface by if people have ideas, uh, I would invite you to share them in the chat box. So the question is, what might the whale song be for energy transition? Uh, the symbol has to be visceral, experiential, and immediately recognizable connection. So a little note saying perhaps uh, we brainstorm as a crowd. Mark, do you have any ideas? I would love to hear the crowd brainstorm. I think like the caveat being, of course, that there isn't a whale song. There has to be many whale songs. Uh, there has to be, and it has to be whole of culture. Like art is an element of culture, but we need to be radically, like uh, Vaclav Smil talks about, we need to be radically rethinking the way that like success is associated with material acquisition. So that's like not just artists, that's all of us. Um, not seeing like a flood of suggestions in the chat here. <laughs> Any thoughts it's on? a big question. It's definitely, uh, it's, it's a tricky space to navigate, but if you do have ideas, feel free to drop them in uh, as we continue to talk throughout the rest of the session. Uh, the next question mark here is how might artists overcome potential barriers due to some people's unfortunate perceptions that artists are irrelevant to their lives or elitist? Yeah, it's a question. Uh, I mean, I think a lot of it goes back to the previous question, like artists need more government support, more recognition, more sectoral support, but we're not just gonna get it. So uh, I think what we can do is enter into spaces like this one um, to engage with folks that we might not otherwise engage with. Uh, like I, I was really enchanted by the idea in the Great Depression of theater artists teaming up with journalists, like unemployed actors, unemployed directors and writers working with unemployed journalists and uh, like what does it look like for 
you know, theater artists to team up with climate scientists or to uh, engage with, you know, uh, I've, I saw some really great examples of the solar panel slash uh, art installation. Like there's those wonderful uh, crossover opportunities. The real challenge is we just don't meet each other. Like it's, it's very rare that a climate scientist and a theater, art, like climate scientist and a theater artist walk into the bar. It's like a joke, you know? Uh, so I think that's something that the EFL can help to facilitate. I think it's uh, something that, you know, again, wonderful groups like Evergreen Theater who are present can help to facilitate. Uh, and it's hard, it's work. You gotta, like, I think part of it is just deciding to do it. That leads into uh, our next question on, you know, what, what are those next steps? So once people have engaged with what we talked about earlier as productive discomfort on climate change through art, what is the next step? What can we actually do moving forward? One of the toughest things for me to grapple with as I was researching for this was uh, hearing all of these people doing these really incredible things to uh, to try to combat, to try to bring awareness to and, and mitigate climate change. Like almost universally, they don't have a lot of hope, uh, are looking at sort of what's happening in the world and the trajectory we're on and are pretty sure that uh, things are going to continue to get really bad really quickly and it's hard to argue with that when the west coast of north america is on fire and uh you know we have melting ice caps uh so what's next uh i think what's next is we keep working as friggin hard as we can in every way that we can for as long as we can uh because the thing is we don't know the only way to know if we're too late is if we throw everything we possibly can at the problem and then discover it's too late. Uh, but we're not gonna know until we treat this like the existential species level crisis that it is. Uh, and that means everybody on board, artists, engineers, oil workers, politicians, trade workers, retail, et cetera. Like we just gotta keep going. Couldn't agree more. All right, we've got uh, James Van Loon on the call as well. He had a question and it's, how helpful or important is it to explore whether energy transition drives culture versus whether culture drives energy transition? That was, thanks for asking that, James. Uh, that was something that I uh, was wrestling with preparing for this too. Cause like, as I mentioned, that one book really seems to be deterministic, really like unidirectional that, there's a prime energy source and culture emerges out of it, which I don't think is true. I don't think that's backed up uh, by history, but I think it's like more true than not <laughs> uh, that the causation path does go in that generally in that direction. And I think that's why it's so important because I, when the Klaus Meal talks about how this threat is insufficiently recognized, I think it's insufficiently recognized. I, I, I spend so much time being like, why are people not screaming in the streets? Why are we not all panicking all the time? Uh, and so those hard questions of like undertaking something that we have never done before, like using culture, deciding as cultures, deciding collectively as societies that we are not going to follow the winds of energy transition. We are going to shape the winds of energy transition is going to take a lot of work. Uh, and I think like there's a really wonderful book, uh, Learning to Die in the Anthropocene. A very short book, very intense book, uh, but it proposes that one of the first steps we have to take is to recognize that the soci societies as we know it are dying. They are not going to survive. And so we need to engage in a mourning process. We need to recognize that reality. And, and that is what will allow us to move forward in the ways that we need to. So anyway, there's wonderful stuff in the chat coming up. 
I, I think we could sit here for hours and ask you more and more questions, Mark. I think we've got time for one more before we have a couple questions for our audience. So this last question is from Kendra and she asks, in order to seed artists into the work for the energy transition, I'm a big believer in embodied experience. What are the places or experiences to share? Mm. Kendra, I can offer thoughts on that, but I'm sure you have some. Do you want to offer them? <laughs> I don't think energy transition is um, is a field that I've really investigated as an artist. And I just wondered from where you're sitting um, in Alberta, if you have a sense of like, we need to bring artists to this place. You need to see this to understand the problem or the possibility. Mm. Yeah, well, I mean, the, the trite answer is everywhere, but... Uh, uh, I just read um, Chris Turner's book, The Patch, uh, about the oil sands development in Alberta. And I'm born and raised in Calgary. And it it helped me understand myself and the place I live in in ways that I'd never expected. Uh, it read almost like an adventure novel at points. Uh, the The sort of like ragged scientific heroism required to crack the secret of uh, extracting bitumen from these oil sands gave me dimensionality of what I just saw as sort of the villain of our climate story that didn't exist before, but also didn't shy away from the environmental and, and uh, existential realities of the oil sands. So I'd say, like, we've talked about the oil sands a lot in the world, we need to talk about them more. Um, but also I think we need to be amplifying like uh, Maggie's on the call, uh, very exciting developments in hydrogen that uh, Alberta and Canada can be part of. Uh, we need, I, I, and I think like all of these new energy sources, like there's uh, Savannah Harvey's on the call who is looking at plastic waste and uh, its association with petroleum. But I think like something that often I find missing from the conversation is just reduction. Like, how can we artistically imagine what does it look like to use less rather than just trying to replace everything, trying to make sure that we're always able to meet increasing energy demand? I think that's something that doesn't get talked about, at least in, in my circles, very much at all. And I think we need to be imagining futures where our lives are different in ways that are less demanding of energy. I don't know. That's off the top of my head. Thank you, Mark. Oh, such amazing answers, such amazing questions. Again, we have more questions in the chat box and in Slido, but we are going to move uh, forward. We're going to bring back the slides. We have a couple questions for you before we close off for the day. Um, and then just a little heads up as well that Mark has a, a video he'd like to share. Uh, we're going to share it at noon here. So if you need to drop off, no worries, uh, please do. But if you'd like to stay for an extra, I think it's seven minutes. Is it Mark? Seven? then we then you're welcome to stay on the call and listen so the question that we have for you is what aspects of energy transition urgently require attention from artists which actually kind of uh yeah pairs nicely with kendra's question storytelling Yes, most artists are storytellers in one way or another, engaging youth, rallying the whale song, energy reduction, finding the hope without implying the solutions are simple or straightforward, sharing a beautiful version of the future, engaging voters. Making it hip and cool. Love reimagining buildings too. A compelling vision for the future. You talked about hope earlier, Mark, and uh, the need to inspire hope. I think that's definitely an important part. What do you think urgently requires attention, Mark? Um, I mean, I think I already said it. I really think we need to learn how to die. 
uh, and learn how that's not a bad thing necessarily that uh, that just because we have a certain expectation of quality of life of of what success looks like now doesn't mean that different definitions of that is going to be worse absolutely so many amazing answers in here we are going to move on to the next poll so what kind of collaborations, interventions, provocations would you like to see between Alberta's art and energy sectors? So I in the chat, it would be great to see artist residencies in some of the big engineering houses, logistic companies, et cetera. Some great crossovers of creativity and knowledge could happen in these spaces. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, artists in residence as well. Also, while we're waiting, I'd love to lift up Kendra's point that uh, artists are culture makers and we are called to imagine the transition from the culture of consumerism to the culture of stewardship. That's huge. It's amazing. A poet in residence, theater companies and climate experts creating a work for public schools. Networking events, pairing artists with others to tell climate story. Biomimicry projects, including engineers, artists, and biologists to look at new energy infrastructures. Visualizing the possibility of energy justice. We've got another one in the chat box, tapping into the creative potential of everyone to make energy transition more personal for everyone. Absolutely. Funding, fund artists to be bold, encourage debate and be an information tool. Love the Isn't idea of an artist, artist provocateur. Often the history of energy company sponsorships of the arts has been more patron based, like make something that we think is nice, but actively bringing in a provocateur could be very interesting. Love that idea. All right, we're gonna to move to the next slide just so we can wrap up and let people drop off as they need to. Um, so just a reminder, the next uh, session that we have is gonna be two, two Tuesdays from now. We're gonna have Steve Saddleback talking about truth and reconciliation and energy development. Uh, and so Steve is the director of National Energy Business Center of Excellence at the Indian Resource Council of Canada. Uh, he's a member of Treaty 6 from the Samson Cree Nation located in Muscochese, Alberta. And next slide, please, Kelly. And then if you would like to stay in touch with us, which we sure hope you do, uh, you can follow us on these different social media channels. Uh, check out our website as well, energyfutureslab.com, where you'll be able to find more about the upcoming sessions, be able to register as well. Um, and then, like I said, if you need to drop off now, absolutely, we're just past one o'clock uh, mountain time, so feel free. And then if you'd like to stay on the call, we've got another little short video, which I'll give you uh, second mark if you want to just quickly frame up the video before we play it. I think it speaks mostly for itself, but this is uh, Shane Koizen and the short story along. Uh, they were commissioned by the uh, David Suzuki Foundation a few years ago to to make this video that I think uh, does a really good job of encapsulating a lot of what, what I tried to talk about today. Uh, thank you so, so much, everybody, for your great contributions and for being here. Thanks, everyone. Enjoy the video. Like many, I love to look at the stars. I love the fact that ours is just one among many. What I love about astronomy is that our constellations tell a story. Our constellations were born from mythology. Mythology was our first attempt to understand the world in which we live. We put a god in everything, and those gods would give us our reasons. Why is the sky blue? Who chose blue? The gods. How come men have nipples? It's the will of the gods. 
Why does this wine taste so good? There's a god in it. And for a while, there was not a single thing that the gods could not explain. We believed that their anger gave us lightning, their despair gave us rain. We whispered our desires to them, believing that their charity would sustain us. But those gods were just stories. But stories became a large part of how we learn. They burn lessons into our memories. They become a part of how we remember, and we can remember almost everything. Right down to that first unbearable bee sting. When we learn that this tiny blue marble we call the world has rules. Rule number one, don't fuck with the bees. An unforgettable lesson brought to you by your memories. I remember that I grew up loving mythology. I remember the story of the Titan Atlas, who was also the god of astronomy. The original global positioning system sending sailors safely home by telling them which constellations to keep starboard. He taught us about the stars. He did all this while he held up ours. Our pale blue dot. But Atlas is caught between two different tellings of his story. In the first, he leads a rebellion against Olympus and is then sentenced to hold the heavens on his shoulders for eternity. In the second story, he is chosen to be the guardian of the pillars that hold up the earth and sky. I prefer the second story. It means that the world is not a punishment, but rather a responsibility. But how can just one be charged with such a burden? How can just one be responsible for all this? When I think of Atlas, I think of a single drop of rain. I think how unfair it would be to hold a single drop solely responsible for making the entire world clean again. I remember how my grandmother tried to explain our world to me. She told me a story. She said the ground and the sky, they love each other, but they don't have arms or rain. That's just how they hold one another. I began to see how the earth and sky need each other, but I wondered about us. In this perfect design, where do we fit? Which piece of the puzzle are we? Like constellations, I began to see a connection between dots. I numbered my thoughts and drew lines from one to the next. I began to see us in the context of a bigger picture, sharpening the blur slowly into focus. We are Atlas. I saw that this pale blue dot, this one world, is all we get. There will be no reset button, no new operating system or downloadable upgrade. We will not be allowed to trade in our old world for a new one with climate control or better fuel efficiency. We get one shot at this. Dismiss all reports of second chances, we get one. And yet we draw advances on our future as if we won't one day be held accountable. We will. We are. The human race runs toward a finish line, emblazoned with the words too far, and wonders, will we ever cross it? Have we already? We are faced with a seemingly impossible task, and it's okay to be afraid. Our dilemma stands before us like a mountain carved into a blockade. The sheer magnitude of our problem would be enough to dissuade anyone. How do we save the world? We lay in our beds, curled into question marks, wondering, what can we do? Where do we start? Is hope a glue crazy enough to hold us together while we're falling apart? The burden seems immense, but we can do this. We must take the martial arts approach to loving our planet, love as self-defense. Forget about the cost. There will be no other thing as worth saving as this. Nothing more important, nothing as precious. This is home. All of our stories start and end here. We are sheltered within an atmosphere that has given us every breath we will ever take. Every monument we will ever make has come from the flesh of our planet. Water like blood, skin like soil, bone like granite. It is not a myth. There is no debate. Facts are in. Fact is, there's never been any question. We are facing crisis. We dismiss the truth not because we can't accept it, but because having to commit ourselves to change is a scary prospect for anybody. The most alarming part of the statement we are facing crisis isn't the word crisis. It's the word we. Because those two letters take responsibility away from one and rest it squarely on the shoulders of everybody. We are Atlas now. But our strength will come from finding a way to share and shouldering the responsibility of turning the impossible into somehow. Somehow we will do this. We can do this.
We can dismiss apathy. We can reject uncertainty. We can be the new chapter in our story. We will not see change immediately. We must act in faith. As the hour hand grips the minute hand and they land on the eleventh hour, we must believe like the seed that change is possible. The seed never sees the flower. It grows knowing that it must become more than what it was. It changes because in growth all of its potential can be unlocked. Change is like rain. It starts with a single drop. Just one. Like our pale blue dot. Caught in an endless waltz called gravity, we circle the sun wondering who, if anyone, left the light on. We are constellations drawn upon the earth. We are connected to one another. We are bound. We must behave as the arms that connect the ground to the sky. We must try to be more like the rain. Our stories may differ. Our goal is the same. How do we save our pale blue dot? We act as the rain, realizing that each individual drop is as equal and important as any. We act as one. Now we are many. Thank you, Mark, for bringing that video to us. That one gave me chills personally. I'm sure I'm not alone. Uh, what an amazing way to bring this session to a close. Really, really inspiring. Uh, we need a better idea of ourselves, better ideas, as James says in the chat box. So thank you so much, Mark, for joining us, for uh, sharing your ideas and passion with us this afternoon. Uh, and thank you, everyone else, for joining us as well. Have a great afternoon. Thanks, everyone.